Yeah. Well, if you're going to meet someone live, you should have good, clean breath, fresh breath. Absolutely. Hey, everyone. It's uh, it's David Barnett. Uh, we're live. And tonight, uh, I've got uh, author John Warlow, who's, uh, who's joining me to talk about uh, Built to Sell. And we're going to be talking about businesses, and we're going to be talking about creating value in businesses, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And while as people filter in here, I'm just going to play the intro, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll start talking to John. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the broadcast podcast YouTube channel where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So, if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like, be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Awesome. So, John, where whereabouts in the world are you located? I'm in Toronto. You're in Toronto. Okay, so I think the first question that I'll have to ask is who will be the prime minister after the end of the night? Oh my gosh, that's a, that's a hot topic. <laughs> I know who I don't want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> but, I can guess that we may have the same opinion on said person. My, my phone's been buzzing all day with, with messages reminding me to get out and vote and all that yep. kind of stuff. And I got out at lunchtime, so it's good. <laughs> John, um, you know, let welcome to the show, first of all. And thanks, and, uh, thanks for doing this live cast with me. I, I really enjoy having people on live because uh, the people get to tune in and, and participate and, and share comments and whatnot. And I think that one of the best things to do to get started would just be to to get into a little bit about your background. I first came across your stuff. I read uh, Built to Sell at one point back when it was, I don't know if it was new or, or just a couple of years old, but I read that book and I really liked it. You want, because I felt a special connection with it. You see, I spent seven years as a yellow page advertising sales rep. Oh, wow. And and that was one of the key examples uh, that you used in the book. Yeah. And um, and so why don't you you share a little bit about your background and how you got uh, to the point where you, you felt you needed to write that book, Built to Sell? Yeah, it probably goes back to a conversation I had with a guy named Perry Miele, a Toronto-based M&A professional. I was running at the time a quantitative market research business. We did big studies for big global brands and each one was a one-off project. And we built it up to five or six million in revenue, uh, you know, 23% profit margin. So it, it, it felt mm -hmm. like a pretty, you know, good business. I thought it was going to be a great, valuable company. And everybody had told me, look, John, you know, someone's going to buy this for your client list, right? Because you got Microsoft, IBM, these are great clients. So I go see Perry and I say, you know, what do you think it's worth? I'm kind of rubbing my hands together. And, and he kind of looked at me across the room from his, oh, his, you know, had his glasses perched down on his nose. And he said, like, depends on the answer to a couple of questions. I said, shoot. He said, okay, well, who does the research? And I'm like, well, I'm involved in some of the, these are big brands. These are micro, you know, okay. Who does the selling? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm involved in some of the selling too. And he's like, okay, well, I can't sell your company. It's worthless. And, you know, I walked into his office, you know, with stars in my eyes, it was a $5 million company, you know, 23% profit margin, these great clients and left realizing I had sort of made all the mistakes there were to make in trying to build a valuable company. And, I, uh, you know, I felt about this tall, about an inch tall in leaving his office, but I, I did commit to really trying to change the business to make it more valuable, which we did, got me out of doing the selling. We implemented a subscription model. Uh, ultimately, it was acquired by a public company. So it had a sort of a happy ending to the story, but it was, um, it was sort of my indoctrination to the world of building uh, a valuable company as opposed to just building a profitable company or a big company, uh, which are what I was chasing before, as opposed to what I think now about a lot. Yeah. I, and, and I find, uh, I meet a lot of people who, who think that it's about the top line revenue, you know, they want to, uh, and, and a lot of the times it's these arbitrary lines, right? I want to cross a million dollars of revenue, then then they want to cross five million, and then ten million, etc. Mm -hmm. And really, it's it's all about what ends up on the bottom line 
And do, do you as the owner need to be there to put your hands on every file or every piece of work to make that come through? Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So what, what year did built to sell come out? 2011. Okay. And, and so what was the, what was the feedback when people started to realize that they needed to, and for, and for those who haven't read it, maybe we could just summarize quickly is, is basically that story you just told, think about how you can bring in sort of systems and processes into a business so that the owner doesn't have to be involved in everything. What was the reaction uh, from the book, from the public? Yeah, it was good. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the original book was self-published, which is a bit of an afterthought, uh, uh, footnote, if you will, in the story. It, uh, it got the attention of a guy named Bo Burlingham, who is quite a well-known guy in entrepreneur circus, wrote a number of books, Small Giants being his most famous. And he read it and he said, like, other people need to read this. It, it reminds me of an updated version of The E-Myth by Michael Gerber was his comment, and which is flattering because Michael Gerber's book is like the, the Bible when it comes to small, you know, yeah. running a small business. So it was very flattering to be compared in the same voice. But he said, look, you, you got to get this published by a mainstream publisher. And so it uh, he generously introduced me to his agent and his agents sold it to random house which is a big big new york publisher and, and sort of that gave it a big push to the mainstream and it's been great it's i, I think look the, the the kind of main message about built to sell is not about how do you sell a company in fact when i do you know i'll do a speech to a group of business owners and not for fun i'll say okay how many you know in the, in the first few minutes of the speech i'll say how many of you guys want to sell your company right and like nobody's hand goes in the air maybe one brave soul's hand goes in the air and then i'll i'll ask a different question i'll say okay how many of you guys would like to know you could sell your business if and when you're ready and like virtually every hand goes in the air i, I think we all would like to know that we're building a valuable asset. You know, it's funny, uh, just this weekend, my wife said that uh, a house across the street from us is going up for sale. So what do you think the first question I asked for? Yeah, well, what are they asking? What are they asking, right? Yeah. Does, does that mean I want to sell my house? No, it means that I want to know that the value of my home is going up in lockstep with the rest of the houses on the street. Same thing is true for building a company. I think you, you want to be focused on building the value of your business. That doesn't mean you want to sell it. It means that you are building an asset that you could sell one day. And that's really what the, you know, everything that we do is really focused on that kind of premise. Well, you know, I, uh, whenever I speak to, to business owners and I start talking to them about this stuff, about, you know, selling your business and being ready to sell and everything, um, a lot of them have this idea that they can get their business ready to sell when they decide that they want to sell. Mm -hmm. And what I like to point out to people is that if you get your business into a sellable state today, what you end up with is a business that is far more enjoyable to operate, usually more profitable. Usually you find other difficulties and problems that are going on in your business. And then you, you set yourself up for having a much more enjoyable, profitable, better work-life balance, et cetera, from now until the time that it, you end up wanting to sell. And, you know, I've, you know, in my business broker days, um, I've worked with a lot of people on helping to get their, their small business in a better state. And when they start to get organized, they start to put some systems in place and they start to be able to delegate some responsibilities to other people and then have systems for accountability and everything. Uh, an amazing thing happened to quite a few of them is they decided they didn't need to sell because yeah. they actually started to get a taste of, of what it would be like to own the business that they dreamed about back years earlier when they were getting underway. They just didn't know how to let go as, as well as they needed to. Yeah, that's a that's a, I think a pretty common sentiment among a lot of business owners that that it, it becomes a lot more enjoyable when you put the you know the processes in play. We talk a lot about standard operating procedures, but basically instructions for your employees to follow. I'm reminded of a woman named Jody Cook who I interviewed on Built to Sell Radio. She built a a great marketing services business. They were they f focused on social media. And she built it, it was like JC social media. It was like her initials in the beginning. So yeah. it was very dependent on her at the beginning, but she was committed to trying to build it so that it wasn't dependent on her. And, and she created these standard operating procedures for her employees to follow and, and real process for everything that she did, you know, how, how to make an Instagram video, how to do a tweet for a client, et cetera. And, and when I asked her, I said, Jody, that must've been, you know, she's a very entrepreneurial woman, you know, 
writing processes is like an antithesis for most entrepreneurs, right? Like it's the opposite of what you want to be doing. You want to be creating, you want to be doing things, selling things. And, and here, here she was like writing all these, these processes out in painstaking detail. I said, that must've been horrific for you. And, and she said, yeah, but I mean, if you have to go to prison, would you rather go to prison for three months or three years? <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll bite. I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, look, if I didn't create the standard operating procedures, when I went to sell, I would have had to succumb to an earnout. I would have had, you know, being, you know, I would have put most of my value at risk in a three or five year earnout. In 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 the end of her story, she did actually sell her agency, and she left two weeks after, which is, as you know, given all that you know about this space, virtually unheard of in the marketing services world. Almost always, there's an earnout because the assets, as Ogilvy said, kind of go up and down the elevator every night. And so, it's uh, in her case, she left two weeks after selling. So, um, you know, it's an amazing story, but it's it really reinforces the importance of standard operating procedures. Yeah. And so, so you ended up turning this whole idea into a, another different business for yourself, right? The, you created the value builder system. Yeah, it's a practice management software for business advisors to help them win the best clients. And so we licensed that to m and professionals, business coaches. And it came about in a funny sort of way. I, I wrote Built to Sell. I had sold uh, my last company. I'd been involved in four businesses that I'd, I'd built and exited. So I felt like I, I wanted to share some of the things I'd learned. And I put this book together and I bought the URL builttosell.com. Hmm. And try to figure out what to put on the URL, or like how to sell books and and I got the idea of putting a little assessment questionnaire together, like 10 questions that would evaluate how sellable your company is. And I did it. I put that together. And so you could go to build sell at the time. You can't anymore, but you could at the time go to build sell and it would give you these 10 questions and you get an answer. Well, about a month after I put it online, I started to get questions, calls from mostly business brokers, but some consultants and coaches saying, hey, we noticed that questionnaire on your website, you know, can I use that? Uh, can we license that? Can I borrow that? You know, like all these questions. And I was sort of between companies at the time. And I thought, you know, there seems to be a real need out there for tools for advisors who want to start this conversation about exit with their clients. And so effectively, that was the very early beginnings of what has become the value builder system, which is a whole platform for advisors to use. Okay. And, and so, and the, the, the people who are using this, they're typically talking to business owners about what size we're talking about like, yeah, it's, lower middle market. Yeah. It's okay. you. The sweet spot is companies with between one and 10 million in annual revenue. Okay. So that would equate to, you know, roughly a hundred thousand dollars in, in EBITDA to maybe, maybe on the top end a million dollars of EBITDA. Okay. And so these, what, what is it then that, that, that uh, the software is helping people, helping the advisors show business owners where they can make the improvements or maybe like sort of a, a benchmarking or yardstick to compare their business with others. Is that it? That's exactly right. Yeah. Advisors who use it get a bunch of different tools. The, the Probably the most above the you know, top of the iceberg, so to speak, is there are three benchmarking assessments we offer. We have one is called the value builder score, which is assesses mm -hmm. your business on eight value drivers that are important to acquirers. Uh, the second is called pre-score, which evaluates your personal readiness to exit your business, the psychological readiness. Mm -hmm. And then the third is called freedom score, which measures your financial readiness to exit your company. So collectively, those three uh, questionnaires are offered by advisors. Mm -hmm. And part of the way business owners start to work with an advisor is the first meeting oftentimes is, is a, a sort of a download or debrief on how they performed on one of those three benchmarking questionnaires. It's, it, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, a lot of the criticisms that you hear in the, in the world of buying and selling businesses um, relate to things like, you know, oh, someone wants a million dollars for their business because that's how much they need to retire, you know, to, right. to get to the, the point of your third questionnaire there, right? You know, how ready are they financially? Mm. Yeah. Um, and then the, the psychological aspect, you know, being ready to pull the trigger. Um, I know that in my own practice, uh, back when I had my business brokerage office open, um, there were many people who would come in and, and I knew that they didn't want to sell. They were just coming to see me because they were trying to relief pressure from some family pressure. You know, they've got, mm. they had spouses and children who were saying, you know, when are you going to retire? When are you going to retire? 
And I began to realize that people would take my initial brochure package folder thing and, you know, come in, meet with me, leave with it. And then they would take that home and set it somewhere where everyone could see it. So to kind of buy themselves some time, you know, so that isn't that funny. Yeah. Because they, they weren't interested. Get off my back. (laughs) They they wanted to, they, they, and a lot of this had to do with like personal identity, right? They identified their persona was the, as the operator owner of that certain business. Yeah. And, and so, you know, tell me about some of the, the most common things that come up in this. Is it, is it mostly the entrepreneur that needs to work on themselves to get ready? Or is it mostly the problems with the business or are they, the two just so interrelated, it's hard to, to separate them? No, I mean, you, you often find really valuable companies that are highly sellable run by owners who are hopelessly unprepared to sell. <laughs> and you often get owners in, in contrast who are really ready to sell. They've got everything ready to go psychologically. They, they want nothing more to do with their company, yet their business is completely unsellable. So no, they're not, they don't necessarily work hand in glove. I think, you know, pre-score is maybe one of the most interesting places to focus because it's really where you separate and you identify how psychologically ready are you to exit. It's, it's based on a number of different kind of factors. One of the factors is what we refer to as pull versus push factors. So what we found is that when a business owner has more pull factors than push, they end up having a better exit. What do I mean by push versus pull? Pull factors are things you're excited to go do next. Mm. You want to run a marathon, you want to write a book, you want to travel to Spain, whatever it is, is a pull factor. A push factor is a frustration, red tape, employees, uh, et cetera. And for a lot of business owners, they come to brokers in particular, and maybe David, in your case, this happened, where they're all push, right? They want to get out because there's a new competitor in town or they're, you know, their gross margins getting eaten by Amazon or, you know, the, the kids are barking at me all the time and they want to get out. And yet that's almost always a recipe for a regret, uh, after the sale because they'll sit back, they'll be sipping lemonade on the, on the, pa- on the porch rocking in their rocky chair and they will all of a sudden wonder, did I leave money on the table? Like, did I sell my business for everything that I possibly could sell it for? And it leads to this sort of sequence of regrets. They lose their identity in the process and, it, and it's just all a, a sort of a spaghetti ball or a, or a snowball of, of, of problems. Whereas if you've got pull it's the factors, opposite of buyer's remorse, it's it's like a seller's remorse. It's seller's remorse, and it, yeah. it's a real thing. It's a real thing. I interviewed a guy named Bobby Martin early in Built to Sell Radio, first year of Built to Sell Radio, and he described the sale of First Research. First Research was uh, in the business of of sales research. Uh, built it up to around six six and a half million dollars in revenue. Got an offer from Dun and Bradstreet for twenty six point two million dollars. This is for a six million dollar company. Like it's almost yeah. unheard of. It was, cra- I mean, he had some technology, some subscribers, so it, you know, there there were some benefits to it. But I mean, it was a crazy multiple. To which Bobby just said, "Where do I sign?" Right? Like this is this is a, you know, he's a young guy at the time and an incredible opportunity. The challenge was he had built first research, as he described it to me, as is kind of like a frat house. Maybe I can't remember if he used that exact words, but it, it had that sort of very collegial feel to it, right? Employees were friends, they barbecued together, everybody was sort of in it together. And Bobby signs the check, and all of a sudden those relationships cool. And and he went through a period of very, very deep depression. He, he became estranged from his wife. He had three kids. I mean, it was a very serious incident where he lost his identity, some of the relationships that he had. Uh, now, he's come out of it and and built another great company. He wrote a book. Uh, what's the, uh, the Hockey Stick Principles, I think, is the name of his book. But okay. he described some of the stuff in that book. Um, but my long story short is, is he didn't do some of the, th- the planning that you need to do to make sure that you don't end up regretting your decision. And one of the things you can do is figure out your pull factors. So get really clear about what you want to go do next. Uh, I'm reminded another Built to Sell Radio guest, uh, Sean Oshman. He had a little IT services company. I think it was a couple million in revenue, probably 100 or 200 grand in profitability. He woke up on his 39th birthday and said, I'm done. I don't want to live in Denver anymore. At the time, he lived in landlocked Denver. And he said, I actually want to live on a sailboat. 
And here he is a thousand miles from an ocean. He wants to live on a sailboat. So he goes, he says, by my 40th birthday, I want to live on a sailboat. So he goes to a broker in Denver and says, look, I, you know, I want out. Broker says, all right, well, I could probably get you two, you know, two to three times SDE, seller's discretionary earnings. Yeah. Sean says, okay, where do I sign? Broker goes away, comes back with two or three offers. They're all in the range of two to three, sells this company. And I interviewed him after this. And I said to him, but Sean, like two to three times SDE, I mean, it's it's not life-changing money, right? Like it's a couple years profit. You could have held the business and you could have got that money. And he said, yeah, but John, you're missing the point. I'm like, okay, what's the point? Enlighten me. And he said, I live on a sailboat. Yeah. And that was his point. It was, wasn't necessarily about eking out every last dollar from the deal. He had a very clear vision of where he wanted to go. He wanted to live on a boat. And he did that. He took his fiance and they went and lived on a boat. And for him, it was a great exit. Not because he got every last dollar of value, but because he had a really compelling pull factor. And again, that's just one of the five things that make up your pre-score. But um, it's an important thing to think through. Well, you know, I've I've had a lot of conversations with business owners about what their business is worth, and and the most common response is just what you said. Well, if I just kept it for the next two or three years, I could have that money and still own it. Yeah. And so it's it's never about cashing out for it, for businesses in this league. It's it's about those pressing personal motivations, and you know, actually the number one in my list of five that I see the most often, number one is burnout, boredom, and fatigue. Yeah. Which is probably exactly the case of, of what he was feeling there in Denver. Well, I doubly so. Air, you know? What's that, David? He was missing the salt air. Yeah, maybe. You know, doubly so right now, you know, we're recording this in Canada, where hopefully we're on the other side of this pandemic, different parts of the world, it's it's still raging, obviously. And certainly in Canada, we still have it. But but the COVID pandemic has been um, really crushing for service businesses in particular. Uh, anyone who has a human relationship with their the way they deliver their service, you know, massage therapists, restaurants, anything like that, obviously has has been crushed. And we've done some research. So one of the questionnaires I mentioned of the three value builder, we have people complete it when they start, you, you know, start business, start doing business with a, a value builder advisor. And we compared their responses to the questionnaire pre COVID to the eight months during COVID that we looked at. Now, again, I'm saying that mindful it's not over, but the pre and during. And one of the most interesting findings is that business owners have moved forward their sell by date by 20%. This is over tens of thousands of users. They've moved up their sell by date by 20%. The other interesting thing, and again, this goes back to a point we were talking about at the very beginning of this conversation, is we asked them, how are you planning to exit? Are you going to do a management buyout? Are you going to sell to a private equity group, sell to a strategic, uh, give it to your kids, et cetera? The proportion of people who said, I want to give it to my kids has dropped from, if memory serves, around 17% prior to COVID to less than 10% today almost in half. And again, our inter it's a quantitative study, so what I don't I can't necessarily tell you for sure, but I can infer that the crisis that the pandemic has brought on business owners has led them to A want to sell sooner, B not want to give that albatross and put it around the neck of their kids. They want to sell it to a third party for the highest price possible and leave. Mm -hmm. And that's what COVID has done to mentality of a lot of business owners. I, I I think this is happening across all segments of society, even yeah. amongst employed people, because uh, I don't know if you've been following the, uh, there's a hashtag, the great resignation. I have. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, so even, even amongst uh, employees, you know, they're realizing, Hey, uh, life is limited. We have a, a finite amount of time. We want to live it the way we want. And yeah. people want to move forward. They don't want to it's 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 funny because uh, you know we all know that we have limited time, but when people keep waiting to do something they enjoy till sometime in the future, you're living as though you have unlimited time. And I think that this pandemic has really reminded people that yeah, there's a limited amount of time. You, you got to get the most out of life, and you don't want to spend it doing things you don't enjoy. It's one of the reasons I, I love this topic because I think it's such an important thing for folks to hear. It's one of the things we just put together a white paper called the Freedom Point. It's an ebook, uh, and it is right down the strike zone of what you're talking about. It, it talks about the point at which the sale of your company, after you pay your broker and your tax, mm -hmm. 
you have enough liquid wealth to live comfortably for the rest of your life. And I think that is a point at which you should buy a really good bottle of wine. You should go to a little cabin in the woods and think hard about whether you want to sell your company. Because if you think about why you got into business for the first place, most of some of us want to, you know, some people want to be the next Elon Musk or Steve Jobs, whatever. But most people got into business for themselves for freedom. Yeah, for financial freedom, but also for the freedom to decide when to work, who to work for, what to do, et cetera. And when you reach the freedom point where the liquid wealth that you've created after selling your business would generate enough money to live for the rest of your life, I think it's at least worth asking the question, do I want to risk something I don't necessarily aspire to have, another zero in the bank account, for what I desperately crave, which is freedom? Warren Buffett uh, said in one of his annual meetings, he said, it's crazy to me, people who risk what they want for something they do not want, mm -hmm. right? So if you've reached financial freedom, that's an aspiration for so many people. Why would you risk it to open the next door, to hire the next employee, to hit the next you know, threshold of, of revenue? Um, I, I think it's at least asking yourself the question, is it worth it? Do I want that? And if you do, great. But if you don't, um, you know, I, I, one of the guys I interviewed on Built to Sell Radio is a guy named Rand Fishkin. Have you ever had him on the show? No. He wrote a great book called Lost and Founder. Certainly encourage people to pick it up. He built a business called Moz, which is in the SEO business. It's a software business. They do SEO ranking and so forth, uh, search engine optimization. And he built it up to $5 million in revenue. And this is a software company. And in his mind, his advisors were telling him that, man, this is going to be worth a truckload one day. It could be worth four times top line revenue. So that's a number that's kind of rattling around in his brain when he gets a call from Brian Halligan. Halligan at the time was the co-founder of HubSpot, is the co-founder of HubSpot. HubSpot's like an all-in-one marketing platform. Yeah. And, and Halligan says, okay, I want to buy your business. I'll pay you $25 million in cash in HubSpot stock. And so Rand thinks about it. He says, okay, well, that's, that's five times my five, but, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to get to 10. I'm pretty sure we're going to get to $10 million in revenue. And when we do, my business is going to be worth 40. So no, Mr. Halligan, I'm not happy with your $25 million. I want 40. Halligan walks away. Rand instead raises some VC funding they use something called preferred shares, which you'd know about, David, but for some of your listeners, they might not know where you get a preferred return and a guaranteed return in some cases before the founder shareholder gets anything. That's important to the story because as the VCs invested, they invested in all different product lines, none of which they were really set up to compete in. The businesses started to bleed cash. Rand suffered a period of depression. He was removed as the CEO of the company. And I interviewed him on Built to Sell Radio after the fact. I said, Rand, I mean, at least you've got your shares in Moz. I mean, that must be worth a truckload, right? And he said, actually, John, they're probably not worth anything. I said, what do you mean they're not worth anything? He said, well, based on the preferred shares and the length of time the VCs have held it, they will probably get paid out entirely, but I don't think my founder shares will be worth anything. Yeah. And I said, Rand, what would that offer from HubSpot been worth based on the appreciation of HubSpot stock? And he said it would be worth close to $200 million. Yeah. You know, I, when you reach the freedom point, it's worth asking the question. <laughs> it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, noise on the internet, you know, a lot of very loud, fast talking yeah. people who talk about how you have to play to win and all this kind of thing. At a, at a certain point, you need to realize when you have to make moves not to lose uh, right. what you've already achieved. And, um, you know, I, I, I frequently talk to people that have uh, gotten an offer for their business and they, mm -hmm. they want a second opinion. And so they'll reach out to me and they'll say, this is what's going on. I'll ask them some questions about the business. And I, I see that all the time where people are thinking like, can I squeeze an extra 10 or 15% more out of this? And, and I'll remind them, just how difficult it is to sell a privately owned business. And I'll, I'll say to them, like, you got an offer, you got an unsolicited offer for your business. Someone's willing to pay money for what you have. It's almost as though you've won the lottery and now you have to try to win it again to pay out. Like 
this and I think the reason that you know people get approached to sell and then they have this belief that there must be this whole group of, of prospective buyers out there that they've got this su super attractive golden goose that everybody wants and it can it can actually lead to the business owner's ego expanding a little bit which can lead to some of the things like you just described where he says you know what 25 you know if I just make these changes I'll get 40 you know kind of thing yeah. And it's, it's what a, what a tragedy, you know, for that fella to, to have things end up that way. Yeah. And you know, all you need is, I believe two competitors and, and every one of us has a second competitor for our business. So if you get an offer, what I would tell you is that there's actually a competition going on. You've got two mm -hmm. bidders for your business already. And that, and again, what you need as an owner, I think is some competition to make sure that the deal terms that you agree to stick through due diligence, right? So you want some competition and you're saying, well, who's the other buyer? If I've got one offer, what's, who's the other buyer? The buyer is you. Yeah. In other words, every day you hold on to your company, you are effectively saying, I would like to go all in, own these shares and not choose to offer. The second thing I would tell you is, is the story of the guys who sold Barefoot Winery. Do you know um, the Houlihan, uh, uh, Bonnie and he uh, Henry, I think is is the guy's surname, but someone could correct me on the internet. I heard the story. Didn't he start in Hawaii? Or, or, no, they started in, in California. Uh, I believe it was okay. in California. They started Barefoot Winery. Uh, kind of a, uh, a sort of he uh, easy drinking table wine, not a fancy wine. They sold it through Trader Joe's primarily in the United States mm -hmm. and, and got tremendous you know, traction. You know, one of the largest independent wine makers in the United States. Uh, they decided they wanted to sell it. And they decided that the natural buyer would be E&J Gallo, right? The, the largest wine maker in the United States. And, and I said, okay, so what, how did you, how did you go about approaching them? And he said, well, here's what I did. I put together our pre-diligence package and what's pre-diligence. And he described it to me as like everything they're going to ask for in due diligence, I did in advance. So all my distributor con contracts, my sales contracts, my employee contracts, like everything in neat binders in the old days, they were physical binders, right? And, and I said, why did you go through all that? I mean, if, if they made an offer, weren't you incumbent to do that after the fact? Like, why would you do that in advance? And he said, here's why. Number one, I knew it would make the deal go more smoothly. But the other reason is that when I went to e &J Gallo, I knew I had one shot for them to take us seriously. They were the most natural strategic acquirer for our business and probably the ones who would pay the most. I wanted to look so ready for the dance that they would draw the conclusion, whether they articulated to me or not, they would draw the conclusion that if I didn't sell to them, I was going to the next closest competitor mm -hmm. and I would sell to them. And Ian J. Gallo, by seeing how prepared they were, drew the conclusion that, okay, these guys are, these guys are going to sell their business. If it's not to us, they're going to sell to somebody else. And so going through that pre-diligence process effectively gave the illusion of competition, made sure E&J Gallo knew they were competing for the business without having to you know, shove it in their face or be egotistical to your point. You can, you can look way too uh, egotistical. Your ego gets out of control. You don't want to do that because a lot of acquirers will just walk away and say, like, I don't want to work with this person. But there are subtle things you can do to communicate that there are competitors, even though there may not be just yet. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And um, if anyone watching wants to pop a, a comment or a question into the uh, into the chat window, we can get uh, we can answer ask some questions of John here too as we as we move along. Um, so one of the um, one of the you know ideas that I had in inviting you on is that I work with a lot of people who are looking at getting out of a job they don't like or they own a business they're looking to grow through acquisition, and if they aim at businesses that are a little bit too big with the low interest rates and the reduced yields from the public markets, what's happening is venture capitalists are getting into smaller and smaller sized businesses. And so a lot of individual buyers find that if they aim for something a little bit too big, they have to compete with these guys that have a lot of money. Yeah. And so a common strategy that's coming about is you look for something that's a little bit smaller that you feel that you can grow. 
And so with the idea being they eventually grow that business up into the, the size where venture capitalists and, and these other people might be interested in acquiring it or strategic acquisitions like you just described here with the wine story. Yeah. So if somebody was buying a business and they had a 10 year horizon, let's say, and they wanted to grow, thinking about sort of the examples and the people you've talked to, what are some of the things that people really need to make a part of their plan in order to make sure that they they lay the right, right foundation as they're growing to, to try to build something that has the best value? Yeah, look, so what you're describing, obviously, is someone who, who is 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 effectively building the value of their company. It's a it's a flip idea. So you sell you buy it for one and you hope to sell it for three down the road, as an example. I think I would look for a transaction business model that could be converted into a recurring revenue business model. Mm. So look for an industry or player inside an industry that is still using a transactional business model and ask yourself, could I flip that into a recurring revenue model? Why would you want to do that? Well, number one, a transaction business model trades at a, a fraction of a recurring business model. If you look at, for example, um, security companies, they trade the two types of revenue. They've got installation revenue, the one and done transactional to install the sensors in the system. And then they've got the recurring or monthly monitoring revenue, right? Typical acquire today will pay about 75 cents for every dollar of installation revenue and about $3 for every dollar of monitoring revenue. So another way, your transactional revenue is worth about qu a quarter of your recurring revenue. It's a huge, a huge value booster. And so I'd be looking at, at any industry where they're still clinging to a transaction business model, you can you can pick it up for a really low multiple because there's their transaction business model in a smaller space, and with it with a view to moving it. I mean, right now this is happening a lot in of all businesses, car washes. So in the car wash business, they I are have a friend in the car wash business. Yeah, so introduce this the VIP club where you can that's right your car washed as much as you want. Exactly. Yeah. It's all you can eat car wash. So basically the old days you got your tank of gas and you, you, you bought an a la carte car wash, which is great. In April in Moncton, you can get all the snow and crap off your car and it's perfect, right? The problem is that nobody's buying a car wash in November on a rainy day in Moncton, right? Because yeah. it's just going to get dirty again. And so car washes had this real seasonality to their revenue. And of course, we all buy a car wash when we happen to be close to a gas station. And so sometimes it's the one down the street, sometimes it's a block down the road. And so there's no loyalty. And so the car wash guys are saying, guys and gals are saying, okay, if we could give a club where for 30 bucks a month, you can get your car washed as many times as you want, that gives us revenue every month, 12 months of the year. And it totally transforms the business. Now people say, oh, well, like I'm going to go underwater because Uber drivers are going to come in and get their car washed every day. Well, yeah, there may be one or two of those, but most people, frankly, have better things to do with their time than get their car washed, right? And yet you get that beautiful recurring revenue. And again, that makes your business more predictable. Ultimately, it makes it way more valuable. So you pick up a car wash for two times EBITDA and you sell it downstream for eight because you've got a recurring revenue model. I'm making those 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 numbers up, by the way. Don't take those to the bank. But my point is, look for a transactional business that you can convert into a subscription business. John, I just became a member of uh, Cineplex's new Cine Club. Oh, great. And you pay a monthly fee and you get a movie ticket every month, which accumulates if you don't go this month, it yeah. just accumulates. I can buy additional tickets for the same reduced rate. And um, I get a discount off of the concessions. And so right. when the when the offer came in the email, I, I quickly did the math in my head. I've got two children. And so if we just went to four movies a year, we I would cut my cost. But what does it do for those guys? It gives them a regular recurring monthly revenue at a time when, boy, I bet you they really need the money uh, with all of these, uh, you know, the problems with the lockdowns and everything that uh, they haven't been able to have regular attendance. You want to uh, you want to look in the mailbag here and we'll see what people are saying? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we got a mic over at Exit Oasis. It says, great stuff, guys. John, what advice would you give to the owners of truly small businesses who want to build to sell? 
what size threshold do you see as a critic as a critical threshold for being sellable? Yeah, again, the thresholds are a little bit they, they they're drive by the the type of buyer. So very small businesses. So well, I'll say very small. Uh, maybe we'll talk about businesses with less than one million in annual revenue. Those are diff- typically bought by individuals. Uh, to mm-hmm. your point, David, someone who's looking for a job, looking to 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 for investment opportunity. Um, that's the sort of front end or low end, so to speak. And then one to ten million dollar businesses. That's when you start to get kind of lower end private equity and and also a few other companies looking to make acquisitions. And then north of say 10 or $20 million of value, you can start to get into some of these more strategic acquisitions. A lot of private equity companies play in that space as well. So it depends a little bit on who your audience is, but I'm assuming by the nature of the question, it's the very sort of quote unquote lower end of the business is less than. Yeah. I think he's asking, is there, is there a bare minimum? And um, you know, when I've been asked that question, I've always answered it this way and said, the SDE has to be equal to or greater than the fair market value of that job. So if you're going to yeah. own, if, if you want someone else to step into your shoes, they have to at least be able to put as much money in their pocket as if they went and got a job somewhere. That's and a now, great point. Yeah. The question of how much they're willing to pay to earn the same amount as they could in a job, well, you know, they may not be very much, but if the other things are there, the freedom, flexibility, et cetera, then it, it may be a mar- it, there may be a market for the business. Yeah, yeah. I think I've never heard that before, but I think that's as good a benchmark as any that uh, that you can use. So great, uh, great stuff. Yeah. Um, and so you know, John, since uh, since built to sell, you you've had some, another book come out. What's why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, the auto the automatic customer was the book that followed Built to Sell. It's about how do you create a recurring revenue in any industry. People who talk about uh, you know recurring revenue, oftentimes they hear SaaS company, right? Like Rand's business, they think of a software business. My goal with with the automatic customer was really to say, no matter what industry you're in, whether you're retail, manufacturer, distribution, you can create recurring revenue. I tell a story in the in the book about the story of H Bloom, which is a flower company. Now, flower stores, I'm sure it's the same in Moncton. I mean, it's a crappy business, right? Like you, you, the, the farmer cuts the, the the flower off the stem, it starts to die in your fridge. Uh, typical flower store throws out 60% of its inventory, right? Uh, it's super, super seasonal, right? Mother's Day and Valentine's Day is when we buy flowers. Uh, and unless you forget your wedding anniversary, you don't really buy them any other time of the year, right? So, so you're left trying to stimulate demand. How do you do that? Well, you rent really expensive real estate on some high street, you know, high traffic corner. So you're paying a huge rent. Um, it's just a crappy business. So along comes these guys, Sonia Pan and Brian Burkhart, and they say, we're going to sell flowers, but we're going to do it on subscription. And so they looked at all the reasons people buy flowers, again, graduation, funerals, weddings, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. And they realized that there was this very small segment of the universe who buy flowers on a recurring basis. And they are five-star hotels. So if you go to the Fairmont in downtown Moncton, my guess is they've got a fresh bouquet of flowers on their reception table. Why? Because they want to give that sort of very prestigious image, right? Well, there's hotels like that all over the world. H. Bloom sells a subscription to flowers. Every two weeks they come, they install a new bouquet of flowers to get rid of the old one. Typical spoilage rate at H. Bloom is less than 2%. Sure. Compared to a typical transaction flower store who sells out 60%. Lifetime value of an H. Bloom subscriber is $4,500. Compare that with the average transaction in a flower store of around $65. You make one sale to a hotel and you capture $4,500 worth of revenue. That's a subscription model in an industry which is not known for subscriptions. So subscriptions aren't just for software companies. They are for virtually every type of company out there, even car washes and flower stores. And so that's what I, I tried to cover in the automatic customer. Listen, and, and you know, it's funny because you can tell this to people who are in business today. And, and so many of them are just so busy running the day to day that they won't stop and put some thought into this. Uh, years ago, I used to have some apartment buildings, some small three and four unit apartment buildings. And there was an outfit that uh, would do the snow removal in the wintertime and they would do the lawn care in the summertime. 
Correct. And, you know, they wanted me to pay, give them like two post-dated checks in the fall for snow removal, then give them two post-dated checks in the spring for, for right. the, the lawn. And I said, look, I said, why don't you just look at each building, work up a price, divide by 12, and let me pay you monthly. Yeah, for, I'll give you a credit card. You can take every month. Yeah. services. Because I said, my cash flow is monthly. I collect rent on the first of the month. And I want to pay you on the second, right? And yeah. the same amount every month. And they said, yeah, that really makes sense. So they started this with me. A year and a half later, I ran into the guy and I said, so how many of your customers have you got on the monthly plan? He's like, well, you're the only one who's asked. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, are you kidding me? Right. Like, you know, this, Here, this is something the, you could take advantage of and you never Absolutely. Did. And again, it, look, it makes your company infinitely more valuable, right? Mm. Infinitely more sellable. Because if you're an acquirer looking at this and you can look at this business and say, look, they've got 112 credit cards on file every single month. On the first day of the month, they ding 112 credit cards. You as an acquirer looking at that saying, man, fantastic. Like I can just install myself and that that revenue stream, annuity stream is just going to continue on. So it makes it more valuable. Some people are saying, but yeah, yeah, I don't want to sell. Great. Here's the magic of recurring revenue is it makes your business more predictable, right? At H Bloom, they only buy flowers for the number of subscribers they have. So in a lawn care company, one of the things is like, how many trucks do I need? Well, I don't know how much demand I'm going to have in six months. So I don't know how many people I'm going to need cutting the lawns. So now all of a sudden you're guessing, right? You're guessing how many trucks you're trying to match demand with supply six months from now. It can be very challenging. Whereas if you've got customers on a monthly basis who are buying snow removal and lawn care, you can know I've got 112 and I need one truck for every 50 customers. Well, I need two trucks. I need two drivers. And you can recruit for those people now. I mean, it makes your business so much more predictable. So it's a, it, I think it is such an, an underused, but a critical element of building a valuable company. Well, and, and, you know, just your point about waste, you know, I mean, this is why catering is a nicer business than the restaurant trade. Right, because if right. you know you have to feed a hundred people, well, then you you just buy enough stuff to make those hundred meals, right? That's right. We have, we have um, a couple of questions that have come up. Um, uh, John's not a business broker, uh, Fred, um, but uh, curious to know about like commissions when people sell their business. I think it's interesting to talk to maybe mention how this changes as the size of businesses change. I know that yeah. when I had my brokerage office open. I used to charge 12% of business value and 6% of real estate value if I happened to sell property with the business. Um, maybe you can speak to that with some of the larger businesses. What have you seen out there? Yeah, sure thing. So in a small business, what I would typically see is 10% of the first million in value, 8% of the second million, 6% of the third million, and so on. Those are for s small businesses, uh, you know, generally a million or two. Or two. So getting 12% is great. I think that's awesome. Uh, I think uh, I've seen a lot of, of commissions that are around 10. Mm -hmm. As the business grows in size, you start to go from business brokers selling your company to you, you probably want to find a quality Main Street business broker, which is someone who sells businesses that are usually one to 10 million in value. And if you go all the way up to $10 million of value or more, you're really starting to get into the world of, of M&A professionals, lower mid-market M&A professionals. And they typically have two fees. They have what's called a work fee, which is a non-refundable fee they charge to prepare a business to sell. It could be, you know, depending on the complexity of the business, anywhere from fifty to hundred thousand dollars. And generally, it's non-refundable, meaning they're using that as a way to test you. They don't want to, you know, you to put the business on the market and, and pull back if you're not interested or don't get the money or get cold feet. It's non-refundable. And then there'll be a success fee. And depending on the sophistication level of the M&A firm, that success fee could be, again, depending on the size of your business, 3%, 4%. I've seen some M&A professionals that won't do a deal for any less than $500,000 fee. So that would be 5% on a $10 million business. Again, you're, you may say, well, that's a lot of money. Remember, I think the role and job of a good M&A professional is to get some competitive tension for your company right? To get that second and third offer. And if you do that, I think you'll find that two things happen. Number one, you'll make sure that you'll maximize the value of your company. It doesn't mean you're going to get a, a huge premium, but in many cases, you're going to get what your company is worth. And you'll know with confidence that you got what your company is worth because you got multiple offers. The second piece though, I think is more compelling. And that is that your buyer will not retrade. Retrading is when 
effectively they lower the price they offered you at the LOI stage at the actual deal closing because they quote found something in due diligence. Now, sometimes they find something legitimate, but most of the time retrading is illegitimate. It's just because they know they can, because they know that you're the only offer they're work or there there is the only offer you're working with. And so I think having an MA professional makes sure that you 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 get maximum value, you get a competitive market for your company. Number one, number two, you can make sure it sticks during due diligence, which I think is arguably the more important factor. And, and, you know, the, the biggest thing I can add to that is do your due diligence on whoever you choose to work with. Absolutely. Because there's a huge, you know, when you get into like larger M and A firms, you know, that are centered in the big cities, it's, it's usually easy to find out their reputation, longevity of the firm, what other transactions they might've done. Those are usually the easier ones to do research on. In the world of of Main Street business brokerages, I I and I heard you use the word too. I I say that there are qualified business brokers, and then there are the rest. And it's yeah. really important if you have a business and you're going to work with a professional to make sure that you're actually working with somebody who who knows what they're doing. Uh, because I honestly every day I'm I'm looking at files and paperwork and and sims prepared by brokers who don't. And yeah. You know, th those business owners, unfortunately, are not being served very well um, in that process by not getting yeah, the help they should. It's a shame, really, because, you know, you think about how long people train to become a chiropractor or even to become a car mechanic. There's all sorts of certifications you have to go through to to deal with these Yet in the business brokering world, there is very little required certification. Now, the IBBA offers some forms of certification that some people take uh, that can give you a heightened degree of confidence. Um, but to your point, David, there is a broad range. So, I, I, you know, I I have lots of brokers that that use uh, you know customers of Value Builder. So I have a, a huge degree of respect for what they do, and the best are. Irreplaceable. I, I truly believe a great M and A professional is an incredible asset in the process, and a bad one can really be a huge liability. So there's just a huge range. So you want to do your your diligence. You want to make sure you're working with someone who's great, really re really appreciates the the uniqueness of your business. I love the question. Like, what do you what do you think is our secret sauce, or what do you think makes us unique? And and I what I what I'm listening for from a broker is a broker who just spouts off the same statistics that he does or she does for every business in your industry. Okay, so you're you're a retailer. I know your your inventory turns are three. Uh, and, and, you know, I know you've got uh, 4,000 square feet. And so I can sell your business tomorrow. That's not what I want to hear. I want to hear what is it about my retail shop, my little bike shop in Moncton, New Brunswick, that is irresistible to a buyer? Like, what is it that makes, makes our bike shop truly unique? Right. Is it because we offer great service or we have a relationship with Schwinn or we have a great race every year and people have come to know us for that? I want my broker to know that and be able to spout and repeat that back to mm -hmm. me. I don't want to hear about retail turns and square footage because that's just you lumping me in with every other retailer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's when uh, when I got into it and and um, I had gone through the the IBBA program it was it was great this is one of the things I actually tell people to look for the CBI one who, yeah pe look yeah, for great. people who've invested in themselves uh, yeah because it takes Huge. a couple of years to complete that program um, the, uh, the 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 package that gets put together to represent a business should be compelling enough to get a buyer interested and excited enough and answer all of their most upfront questions to the point where they're, they realize that to make the next step, if they're not in the same city, they need to go and buy a plane ticket to go visit the business. And, and, and it, I think that's one of the, the best ways to describe it because I've seen so many of these three page, you know, memorandums that don't have any information and you're, 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 right. you're left wondering what, what they do at the business, you know? Yeah. The business and, and they give you a P and L. And a yeah. And then I've seen, sheet. I've seen some exceptional ones, which are 25 pages that have photos yeah. and maps and information about the market and, you know, talk about all kinds of different things and the history of the business. And you're like, wow, like this is, there's a legacy here that might, yeah. you know, might want to be a part of. This reminds me of, of a really important point that I, I think your listeners would, 
would benefit from hearing. It goes back to a story from uh, years ago, I was invited uh, to a, a program at MIT, the famous college in Southside Boston, and it was their executive education center. It was for a group of entrepreneurs. They called it the birthing of giants. If you think of a more pretentious name, I'll challenge you to do that. The birthing of giants. You had to have a million dollars in annual revenue and be under the age of 40 at the time. So I was, again, this goes back 20 or so years. And I went to this thing as a, as a, as an entrepreneur and we heard from all the great sort of business thought leaders at the time. Jack Stack talked about employee ownership and Pat Lynchoni was just starting out. He's the guy behind the five dysfunctions of a team. And, and, and we heard from this one entrepreneur named Richard Watkins. I think that's his name. And he came in and we, I can never forget, we were in like an amphitheater style seating, right? 60 of us all kind of looking down at the pit at him. And he came in and he said, okay, first, first thing he said out of the gate, he's like, how many of you guys are involved in selling and marketing your product or service? And like, you wouldn't believe all of our hands went in the air. Like the five-year-olds at, at, you know, at, at, at the first day of class, like, pick me, pick me, like all of us, right? Hands in the air. And he's like, all right, put your hands down. And he said, look, you've all got the right skills. You're selling the wrong product. You should hire salespeople to sell your product. You need to sell your company. You need mm -hmm. to save and invest all of those resources, the way you sell your and position your product and start thinking about your product as your company. That's when you're going to get many millions of dollars, hopefully, in your return for your time invested, not when you sell your product. And I think so many entrepreneurs, we, we, we will spend hours pouring over click funnels and our brochure and our website and all the things that the way, you know, the side of the vans, how, what color are we going to make the vans, all that stuff, all the marketing stuff. Yet when it comes to selling our business, we hand it to a broker and say, you know, just get the best of what you can for it. And here's my PL. Hmm. It's, there is a, a a real art to selling a company, and and first and foremost, it's about positioning your company, and it's the marketing story you tell about it, and that's why the best business owners and their advisors, brokers, and M and A professionals, they will create a twenty five page sim, which is effectively a sales document. That when an acquirer looks at that, they should be booking their first flight on a to come see you, right? It should be yeah. that compelling. And, and I've never forgotten that speech at MIT and just how, uh, how those skills that I had been focused on how to sell a customer, I should really reorient about how do you, how do you sell and market my business and make it more valuable? Well, it's interesting because, you know, when, when, when I was going through my broker training, um, I was Ed Pendarvis, the guy who founded Sunbelt Business Brokers, he, he basically said, you know, that business it's like a piece of inventory on your shelf. If you want to think about the business broker store, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 so it all has to do with uh, making the, the most attractive, best packaged thing so that when somebody walks in that store, they're going to say, that's the one I want, right? Yeah. John, how um, how can people find you now? Is, is, is uh, your show the easiest way to tune in and learn more? Just head to builttosell.com. If you go there, uh, top right-hand side of the screen, there's a little button that says free gifts. If you opt in there, we'll send you the nine subscription model worksheets, uh, the art of selling your business workbook, uh, the eight drivers of company value. It's all free. So just built to sell.com and then uh, just click on the button free gifts. Awesome. And another comment here from Ryan, do you teach support new acquirers? Ryan, yes, I do. Just head over to businessbuyeradvantage.com and you can uh, you can learn more about that. And um, and Derek says that I'm really good at it too. So there you go. <laughs> thank awesome. you very much, Derek. It's highly appreciated. For for those of you that are tuned in uh, live, or if you're watching the recording afterwards, please hit the like button. It really helps the YouTube algorithm uh, let people know that this is a, a great video to watch. And uh, John, I want to say a big thank you to uh, to spending some time with us today. I know that uh, the, the people love to be able to have access and, and hear the stories and, and talk to people who've who've been through this stuff and have seen as as much as uh, as people like yourself have. Cool. Thanks for having me, David. It was fun. All right. And with that, we'll say see you later, everyone. 
And uh, oh, I've got a look. I even I have to play this. We'll see you later, guys. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Head over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me, learn how I work with my clients. You can learn about my books, courses that I prepared for you. You can also find out all about how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, etc. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest.